Sylvia's demeanor had run the gamut, from warm and friendly to combative, and now she looked like she wanted to toss me out of her office on my ass. She pushed herself up from the chair and leaned onto the desk. I'm not in the habit of sending clients to my competitors, Miss Jackson. I suggest you consult the yellow pages. If there's nothing else, Janet will show you to the front desk. The receptionist will validate your parking. She pressed a button on the phone and chirped brusquely. We're done here. Tell Gibson to come to my office, please. Of course, ma'am, came the crystal clear response from the speaker. I stood and slid the handle of my bag onto my shoulder. I was even more eager to get out of that office, out of that suite, out of that building. This was a bad idea. I'll see myself out, I mumbled, almost stopping to offer a handshake to Sylvia. She was preoccupied by the stacks on her desk. I'd been dismissed. I pulled open the double doors and hurried down the hall toward the front desk, head down, on a mission. I rounded a corner and walked right into a wide, solid chest. Oh! I leapt backward a few steps and tried to get my bearings. My bag, which slid from my arm mid-collision, was splayed on the carpet between us. Half of its contents spread across the hallway. Ma'am, I am so sorry. Let me help you clean that up. A well-built man in a dark tailored suit squatted to gather my belongings and handed them to me so that I could stuff them inside my bag. I was thankful that I hadn't been dragging around my personal items, tampons, lip gloss, mini vibrators. My date book, pens, and business card case were embarrassing enough. Did we get everything? His eyes swept the area, then lifted to mine accompanied by the most handsome smile I'd seen since I first met Warren Jackson. Smiles were my kryptonite, and his... Mm, thick lips, two rows of straight white teeth, deep skin tone and dark, soulful brown eyes, the kind that made you want to pour a glass of brown liquor and get lost in them. My mouth suddenly felt like it was full of sawdust, and my breathing was slightly labored. I, I think we got everything. Thank you, and sorry for running you over. No need to apologize. I was looking at my phone, not watching where I was going. He extended a hand, palm up. Without even thinking, I slid my palm across his. Gibson Kincaid, are you a client? His question made me laugh, which wasn't a reaction I expected to have at not being accepted as a client. No. In fact, I met with your mother, and we decided that Kincaid isn't the firm I'm looking for. Oh. His eyebrows shot up, nearly to his hairline, which I noticed was lush with dark-as-night curls. Did she give you the bring-them-to-their-knees-we-make-them-pay speech? She loves that line. His smile was devilish. The twinkle in his eye was way too tempting. The lilting, teasing tone of his voice had my thoughts meandering in a direction they had no business going in. I was in this stuffy gray office trying to divorce my husband, not pick up a new man. Uh, yep, I answered with a deep nod. I did get that speech. Unfortunately, as much as I want to, um, make him pay, Kincaid isn't the firm for me. Oh, that's too bad, if you really feel that way. But not all of us practice law like my mother does. Some of us are a little more sensible. He smiled again, sending sparks skipping down my spine. Tell you what, he said, reaching into an inner pocket to pull out a business card holder. He plucked a card from the silver case and flicked it out at me between two fingers. Two long, thick, manicured fingers. Give me a call. We can talk. If I can work something out, I'd... Gibson! We both turned at the sound of Sylvia screeching down the hall, disturbing the quiet. I felt bad that I'd kept him from his mother's beck and call, so I took the card and stepped around him. Thanks. Sorry to keep you. My pleasure, he said, still standing in the middle of the hallway, clearly in no hurry to answer to Sylvia. I didn't catch your name. Miss... Vanessa. Vanessa Jackson. Miss Jackson, he responded, extending his hand again. Again, I slid my palm across his and reveled in the gentle strength as it closed around mine. Chapter it was a five. pleasure running into you. Gibson. On a small patch of land outside a sprawling country house, 
a few paces across a deep green, perfectly manicured lawn. I dug my steel shovel into Georgia clay. I turned it, reveling in the sound of the moving dirt, working up the roots from the weeds that had taken hold over the mild winter. A breeze blew in from the lake that shimmered in the setting sun. The day had been cool, but not cold. It was beginning to warm up, which was good for my garden, and for me. It wasn't time to plant yet, but I liked to work the soil and get it ready for the bulbs and seeds that I'd be laying in it soon. Aside from the prize-winning dahlias I had been cultivating for the past few years, my spring and summer garden was usually bursting with color and variety, from lilies to thistle, sage, mountain fleece, and geraniums, as well as a few types of roses. Beyond the flowers, trees, and shrubs was the raised-bed vegetable garden, bordered by landscaping wood and concrete blocks, covered with a dome of plastic tubing and vining to protect the plants from blazing summers and heavy rain. As a habit, I spent a few hours a week in the garden, planning and organizing, maximizing the space for the vegetables I wanted to plant this year. It was as much therapy as it was gardening. Working with my hands or my tools gave me something to do while I mulled a course of action, a trial argument, the wording of emotion, or worked out some frustration. I hadn't planned to be in the dirt tonight, but my blood was boiling, and I wasn't one for hitting the gym. I'd come home, changed into my gardening clothes, and headed right outside to catch the last hours of sunshine. I stabbed the shovel into the dirt, rotating my wrist to turn it and reveal the dark, moist earth underneath, reaching in to grab weeds and toss them aside. My mind wasn't on fresh, crisp vegetables or bright flowers, though. As I drove the shovel into the clay, my thoughts were consumed by my conversation, well, argument, with my mother. The plan had been to give her the first few years of my career, get my feet wet, learn about being an attorney by being an attorney. No law school student graduates with any practical knowledge of what it means to be a lawyer. We knew case law, could recite it by heart. Billing, case management, client management, all concepts learned with experience, which is why Mother and I agreed that it would be great to gain initial experience at Kincaid. But then I was supposed to move on. She'd give me some money to open my own firm and spread word around town about her son's law practice. That was the promise, almost four years ago. I thought I understood why Garrett, Gabriel, and Gregory never left Kincaid. They were too comfortable, too accustomed to the way Mother does business and practices law, and they made too much money to go elsewhere. Now I saw that maybe Mother made it too hard to pull away. Maybe she's right. Maybe I'd get out there and fall on my face. Maybe it'd be a mistake. At the end of the row, I turned around to inspect my work. But it'd be my mistake to make. I stepped back from the bed and stood the shovel up, leaning on it while I wiped sweat from my forehead. I counted out the rows I dug in preparation for planting warm season vegetables, snap peas, cucumber, okra, squash, and tomatoes, and soon after that, onions and potatoes. I could also get some herbs in. My plans were interrupted by the ring of the phone, sitting across the yard where I'd left it. I laid the shovel down next to the garden bed and strolled across the lawn, grabbing the phone up before it rolled to voicemail. Gibson Kincaid, I answered, dropping into one of the chairs placed around a glass-top patio table. Hello? I recognized her voice right away even over the phone line. Most of my body came to attention at the sound. This is Vanessa Jackson. We met earlier today at Kincaid. I remember. I hope you're calling to discuss your case. Deadbeat and low-paying as the cases were, I had plenty to keep me busy. So why I was fixated on offering her representation was beyond me. Maybe it was her eyes. 
or the cloud of disappointment and dejection that surrounded her as she came out of Mother's office. But something compelled me to reach out to her. Background noise, which sounded like a bar, almost overpowered her voice as she answered. I was, actually, and I'm sure you spoke to Sylvia after we met, so you know all the details, and I want you to know that I'm not looking for a handout. I'm in a situation, and I need legal help to get out of it. I wasn't expecting you to ask for a handout, and I didn't speak to my mother about your details, which wasn't a lie. We quickly moved on to her usual grievances during our meeting. So, why don't you tell me about your situation and how I can help? Well, she began with a sigh. The noise behind her quieted, then disappeared as I heard the soft thunk of a door closing. I've been separated for a year, not legally. My husband left. He's moved on, but we've made almost no progress with dissolving our marriage. Things are getting ugly, so I need to move as quickly as I can without compromising support for my daughters. Sylvia seemed hell-bent on going after money and assets, and she sighed a soft breath into the phone. That's not really what I was looking for. My eyebrows rose at the mention of her daughters. You have children? And he's not providing for them? Yes, two. He sees them when he feels like seeing them, which isn't often. The bigger issue is that there's no support order, because either he won't agree to anything, or he threatens to file for bankruptcy so there won't be any money to pay a support order. Vanessa. I gently interrupted. Hang on a second. First, it's not up to him. If he's telling you that he controls the amount he pays, or even if he pays support, he's talking out of his... Well, you know, we file for support and the judge awards it to you, and it comes out of his paycheck, whatever that is. If he's not earning, it piles up in arrears until he is working. Now, if he's left the family home, he's living with someone else, has begun another relationship, we have a case for abandonment, and the divorce may go faster. But child support is separate from a divorce action. Oh, I... The line was quiet, except for the barely detectable hum that told me she was still there. I didn't know that. He said... She huffed. So I could have filed for support a long time ago? Let's not worry about what you could have done. The past is lived, and we can't go back. Let's talk about the future and what I can do for you. By the time I finished talking to Vanessa, she sounded more hopeful, less terrified and desperate. Her almost ex-husband was a piece of work. The lies he fed her kept her right where he wanted her, just below the surface, scrambling for air, poor and scared to make a move. She barely knew which way was up. The sun was a crimson, glowing line along the horizon. The evening was getting cooler, and the breeze coming off the lake was chilly. I pulled myself up from the patio chair and ambled toward the doors, sliding them open and stepping into the house. I worked my gardening boots off my feet and left them at the mat that I kept near the door. I'd like you to review some documents and fill out some paperwork so we can get started. We can also discuss my fee. Does this mean you want to take my case? It's more a question of if you want to retain me. This isn't a quickie divorce, but it's not complicated either. I promise you, though, that you'll be a free woman soon. Wow, she replied practically breathless. With everything that's been going on, I thought, I can't even believe it's possible right now. Thank you. Don't thank me yet. You haven't seen my fee schedule. I laughed and was happy to hear the return of a low, sexy giggle in my ear. I moved to the kitchen, where I pulled a container of leftover steak tips and rice from the refrigerator, placed it in the microwave, and set the timer for a few minutes. I leaned my hip against the counter and listened to the fan as the machine warmed my dinner. I can't imagine that you want to come back to the law office to go over paperwork. I'm usually out in the community a few days a week. Is there a place I can meet you? Uh... A deep, heavy breath sounded over the line. I'm a real estate agent, so I could be anywhere at any time during the day. But, actually, I had to pick up a second job at my uncle's restaurant— I'll probably be here most nights. 
Sam's Barn Grill on Broad and Decatur. You probably don't know the place. Home of Sam's famous lemon pepper chicken wings. I sure do know the place. She sucked in a breath, which I read as surprise. How do you know about Sam's? I take some meetings at Gladwell Books next door. It's nice in there. But after a while, a man needs something more substantial than a cinnamon raisin scone and fancy coffee. It's an old-fashioned place, for sure. But your uncle knows how to... How do they say it? Put a hurtin' on some chicken. Yeah, they say that. But I'd better not tell him that someone called his lemon pepper wings famous. We'll never hear the end of it. Her lightened mood was palpable over the line now. She was laughing freely, which was a nice sound. So... I'm here from six to nine, most nights. Stop in for dinner when you can, and we can talk. It's a date, is what I said before I could stop myself. I mean, I'll stop in. Sounds great, Gibson. I'll, I'll see you soon. The line disconnected, and I tucked the phone away, then opened the microwave door to quiet its incessant beeping. Just another case, Gib, I mumbled to myself. I dumped the container of beef and rice into a plate, then headed to the living room and settled into my favorite leather recliner. The widescreen mammoth TV popped on at the press of a button, mid-broadcast of a basketball game. Just another case. Yeah, right. I pulled open the heavy wood door at Sam's Bar and Grill, pausing to wipe my feet on the mat at the entryway. It was raining so the mat was already soaked and wasn't doing much to rid my shoes of leaves and mud. "'Pull that door shut tight!' called a raspy male voice from behind the bar. I reached back and pulled the handle as the door caught a gust of wind. I wrestled with it, then overpowered it, and pulled it shut with a slam. "'Thank you,' called the voice again. "'If you don't shut it real good, it'll bust open and be like a tornado in here.' I moved toward the bar, hand outstretched. A new edition of flat-screen TV had been hung above the bar, and the few restaurant patrons in the place had their eyes glued to it. "'Good to see you, Sam. How are you this evening?' He gripped my hand with a tight, strong grasp, and gave it two polite pumps. "'Rather be sitting next to my lady on an island somewhere, but this here ain't half bad, I guess.' He chuckled, then leaned into the bar, you want some of them wings you order every time you come in here? I couldn't help the grin that spread across my face. And a side of fries, if you don't mind. You the one paying for it. I don't mind at all. He turned to bark my order to the cook in the kitchen. The cook confirmed, and he turned to me again. I suppose it's after business hours at whatever fancy job you got that makes you wear them shoes that ain't for walking in the rain. What can I get you? Brown or browner? Not quite after business hours for me, Sam. Actually, I leaned in and lowered my voice. I'm looking for your niece, Vanessa. Is she around? Sam's expression morphed from a friendly disinterest to a suspicious scowl. A large wooden bat appeared from somewhere behind the bar. He gripped it in one large hand. What you want with Vanessa? You been in here spying for her trifling asshole of an ex-husband. Ought to throw you out of here right on your uncle. I tried not to let my relief at being rescued show on my face, but I'd never been so happy to hear a woman's voice. Stop it. Put that down. This is Gibson Kincaid. I hope he's still interested in being my divorce lawyer. Sam's face slowly relaxed, still suspicious, but less angry. All right he growled. Good thing Vanessa was here. You almost got it, son. Never know who might be coming through and what they won't. My policy is to beat that ass and ask questions later. Oh, please. You haven't hit anything outside of a baseball with that bat, and it's been thirty years since that happened. I was happy to see the bat lower and disappear behind the bar again. You ain't got to tell the whole place my business, girl. Vanessa laughed then hooked a hand into my elbow and pulled me toward the back of the restaurant. I'm taking a break, Uncle. We'll be in the back. You just got here, talking about taking a break. And supposing you want me to deliver his order to your table? That'd be great. 
she said over her shoulder. To me, she winked and said, Don't worry about him. He's all bark. All the same, I'll stay in his good graces. At a booth in a corner of the restaurant, the surface of the table showed that she'd been there a while. Stacks of folders, envelopes, and papers covered half of the table. I brought everything I could think of that might help. I thought you'd want to look at it all, and I wrote up a summary of my situation. These will probably be helpful, though not immediately. If we have to go to court, I may need it. I slid into one side of the booth and set my satchel at my feet. I rested my elbows on the table and clasped my hands together. She mimicked my pose, but I noticed her hands trembling. You seem tense. How are you doing? Up and down since our conversation last night. I spent a lot of time on the Internet researching things. Her eyes lifted to meet mine. Not that I didn't believe you. I wanted to see for myself. I've been so... She exhaled a deep sigh and brought her hands to her cheeks. I feel so stupid. When it comes to Warren, he has a way of saying things that you don't question. When he said I couldn't make him pay because we weren't divorced, and that I couldn't divorce him because he'd never signed the papers, I've heard it all. The rantings of a man trying to maintain control. Hardly ever lawful or enforceable. That's why you need a good attorney. An attorney who's interested in more than your wallet. She started to laugh, but covered her mouth with her fist, hiding a small but smug grin. What's your mother going to say when she finds out you picked up my case? She said Kincaid couldn't help me. Sylvia Kincaid can't help you. I grabbed the handle of my satchel and set it next to me, flipping open the top and pulling out a thin file. I opened it to the first page, a contract that stated a client was retaining my services. Gibson Kincaid is going to do everything he can to make sure that you get your divorce. I like the sound of that, she said, her eyes roving the first and then the second page. So there are a lot of blanks on this fee schedule, because we need to talk about that. It doesn't do any good for me to bill an insane amount that you can't pay. Why be in hock to your lawyer, right? What works better is for us to figure out how long we think we'll work together and agree on an amount per hour that you can afford. If we need to work with a cap, I'll work until that's satisfied, and then we can negotiate a higher cap. Oh, okay. That's different. She smiled, digging a pen out of the pocket of her apron. I've never heard of an attorney working it that way. Sometimes you have to think outside the box. I'm not free, of course, but I'd like to help you, if you'd like me to. I could have slapped my own self for how deep and seductive my voice sounded. I wasn't trying to get her into bed, just to sign the contract. I talked to hundreds of clients, many of them young, attractive women. I had no problem talking to them, being professional, businesslike, straightforward. That I couldn't talk to Vanessa without putting on that tone was working my nerves. I know I should read this first, but I feel like I can trust you. You're telling me everything I want to hear, and I don't even care if it's lies. I'm so desperate to get away from my husband. She signed and dated the blanks on the contract with a flourish, then slid them across the table to me. I'm willing to take the leap. You won't regret it. I signed the line above my typed name on the contract. And there are no lies. Take this home and read it top to bottom. It's very straightforward, but if there's something you don't like, we can strike it, cool? Vanessa had visibly relaxed. Her shoulders weren't hunched around her ears. Her jaw wasn't square with tension, and her hands didn't shake anymore. She nodded, her eyelids at half-mast. Her lips were bent, very slightly, in a dreamy smile. Cool. Everything sounds cool. So you work here? Part-time? She nodded. Temporarily. My uncle's way of helping me out. She reached for a glass of water that she'd set to the side and closed her lips around the straw. My mind went into overdrive, imagining those lips doing the same thing somewhere else. She licked her lips and slid the glass away. 
I must have been staring, because she tilted her head and stared back, her brows raised. So, lay this out for me, Mr. Kincaid. How will this work? Gibson. First, you can call me Gibson. So I was attracted to her. So it affected how I handled her case. So I was offering her the lowest rate I'd ever, ever offered a client. So my mother was going to have a screaming fit. Right after we had that argument about my fees and the cases I brought to Kincaid. Right after she told me not to take this case. The woman that sat across from me had hope. She saw light at the end of the tunnel, and the thought that she might soon be free gave her face the sexiest expression. And I Chapter put it there. eight, Vanessa. Here you go, gentlemen. There's ketchup and hot sauce on the table. I set the large pan of wings and giant bowl of seasoned fries that a group of college-aged guys had ordered in the center of the table, and handed the serving tray off to the busboy as he passed. I'll get refills all around, too. Can I get y'all anything else? Your number, if you're handing things out, pretty. A much too young but very handsome man was trying his best to flirt with me. His skin tone was deep, but his eyes were golden brown. His face bore the start of what might eventually grow into a goatee, someday. I laughed, gathering empties and discarded straw wrappers from the table. Zero? as in the number of chances you have with me? A tenor chorus of ooh and curve sounded around the table. You could have let me down gently, miss, he said, his grin showing that he wasn't the least bit hurt or deterred by my deflection. You can't even grow hair on your face, and you're trying to push up on a woman probably ten years older than you. I admire your hustle. But there was no way to gently let you know that you don't have anything I'm looking for. My internal radar went off, and I looked up toward the front door as the table burst into claps and laughter. Gibson stepped into the bar, wiping his leather clarks on the welcome mat and staring at his phone. He was, oh, so casually handsome, in a dark blue polo shirt that seemed molded to his chest, his arms, his torso. Dark rinse boot-cut jeans fit him like they'd been styled specifically for him. I stifled a long exhale, as I realized I'd been waiting all morning for him to come in. He glanced up as I turned to see him walk in and smiled, giving me a brief wave with the phone in his hand. He motioned that he was heading to his usual table, which I'd been keeping clear in case he happened to stop by. Oh, I see. One of the other young men at the table started, having watched my brief interaction with Gibson. See, that's what's wrong with women today. They're not willing to work with a young brother, be in the trenches with them, build something with them. They want that money, that swagger, some of what's already been established with some corny square that walks around with a satchel over his shoulder and wears boat shoes, rather than a young buck trying to make a difference in the world. See, black women today are counterfeit. And that, man, shut your ignorant hotep ass up. I couldn't help joining his friends and clowning the young man as I left the table and made my way to the handsome man with swagger, a satchel, and boat shoes. Which weren't boat shoes. Young men didn't know what nice loafers look like. Hey, you. I slid a thick paper coaster onto the table, as well as a napkin and a set of silverware. Can I get anything for you? Hey. He greeted me back, unpacking his bag and getting himself situated. Some water would be great. I've been on a two-hour marathon conference call this morning, and my mouth feels like cotton. On a Saturday? No days off, huh? Very few, he responded, but with a smile. I like it that way. Keeps me out of trouble. Speaking of, any word? It had been quiet, too quiet. Gibson filed the divorce on Wednesday. It was Saturday, and I hadn't heard from Warren. Though he wouldn't be notified by process server, because I couldn't pin down where he lived or worked. 
I was still sure that someone, somewhere, would let him know that official documents had been filed with the courts to end our marriage. The notice was scheduled to run Sunday in the classified ads in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I, Vanessa Lynn Jackson, am serving notice through publication to Warren Keith Jackson for divorce in Fulton County. Warren Keith Jackson, you are hereby notified to plead to said complaint within 30 days from the publication hereof. If you fail to plead to the complaint or file a counter affidavit within 30 days of publication, the court can enter a final decree in divorce. The ad ended with contact information for Gibson at Kincaid Family Law Firm. Would Warren respond? Absolutely. It was how he would respond that had my nerves shot. Would he show up at Donovan? Would he come to Sam's? He knew where my aunt and uncle lived, what my usual haunts were. Would he wait until I thought I was safe and then pounce? Or would he actually let it go? Let me go. Let our marriage end and let me move on. Not a peep. I leaned against the seat across from him, weary from worrying and waiting, on edge from anticipating his response, whenever it came. He for sure doesn't know yet, because I would have heard from him. He's not the type to not respond. Gibson seemed satisfied. At least you've had some peace. You're working day shift today, because of the game? Yeah. Uncle figured the place would be busy. I waved my hand around the nearly full interior of the bar, most of them watching the Atlanta Braves' season opener. My aunt will drop the girls off later, and we'll walk home. We just live a few blocks away. Sounds like a great day. It'll be nice to spend some time with— Order up! Uncle bellowed, loud enough for me to hear at the back of the bar. Let's get a move on, Vanessa! I inched away, giving Gibson a withering look. I'm being rudely summoned. I'll come check on you in a minute. Hurry up, Vanessa! I'm not gonna call you again! I'm coming, uncle, I yelled back. If you don't stop showing out, I'm going to tell auntie on you. The crowd had begun to thin out. The Braves won the home opener, and everyone was jubilant, ordering more drinks and more food. But by late afternoon, the bar was down to its usual Saturday regulars and the familiar humdrum of activity. I took advantage of the lull in business to wipe down tables, sweep around the bar, and move chairs back to their respective areas. Gibson was still in his spot headphones on, head bobbing to whatever music was pouring out of them, fingers flying over the Bluetooth keyboard. He made sure to keep his food and drink orders coming, and tipped very, very well. Otherwise, Uncle would have a lot to say about him sitting in the bar all day. I didn't mind him coming in at all. The thoughts I'd had about him a few nights ago hadn't exactly died down, but I wasn't panting like a Labrador in heat for him, either. He was a good-looking man— about my age, or a few years older, sexy and single, he was doing a lot for me, at great personal sacrifice. Of course I was attracted to him. I hadn't had anything resembling sex in a year and a half. By my calculations, I was about to be divorced. I should be attracted to a whole lot of men. I thought about the young man that had hit on me earlier in the day, and wondered, if he was older, with a career, and facial hair— would I have paid him any attention? I'd never been attracted to a whole lot of men. Despite all the options that walked through the doors at Red Heels, only Warren had caught my eye. And only he could hold my attention. For a while, at least. The door to Sam swung open so violently that it slammed against the brick front of the building, causing the entire room to shake. In the doorway, with the sun behind him, was a silhouette— a tall, wide-shouldered, foreboding silhouette. Warren! What? He came straight for me, clutching a page from the newspaper in one hand. Once he was within a few steps, he grabbed me by the arm and yanked me toward him. He shoved the newspaper in my face and snarled, What the fuck is this shit, huh? I managed to twist out of his grip, but not for long. As soon as I got a couple of steps away, he grabbed me by the shoulder and pulled me back, wrapping a thick hand around the back of my neck. You think you slick, don't you, bitch? He growled in my face, inches away from me. His eyes were bloodshot, 
like he hadn't slept in a long while, and his breath was putrid, like he'd been drinking for days on end. I told you I wasn't signing no fucking divorce papers. How you gonna put an ad in the goddamn paper talking about you divorcing me, huh? Need to let her go right now lest you want this wood upside your head. Distracted, Warren turned to find Uncle standing behind him, the big wooden bat he kept behind the bar in both hands and poised to strike. Don't think I won't bust that big head wide open, Warren. Warren chuckled, but his grip loosened. You ain't gonna hit nobody with that bad old man. You forget I know you. You ain't been able to say shit to me for ten years, and you ain't gonna start saying shit to me now. Uncle lifted the bat higher and cocked it back like he was about to hit a home run. A loud, resounding, Sam, no! Stopped him. Gibson rushed from the back of the bar and grabbed the bat. All he has to do is file a complaint and you have a world of trouble. You don't want that. To Warren, he said, You need to let her go. Right now. Before things get worse. Warren chuckled, the sound deep in his throat. Worse? Who is this? Somebody's knight in shining armor? Gibson moved with lightning speed, landing a punch in Warren's neck, right in the windpipe. It was enough to get him to release his grip, after which Gibson grabbed me and moved me behind him. Vanessa, go. Sam, get her to the back, behind the bar somewhere. Sam did as he was told, wrapping his arms around me and ushering me behind the bar and into the kitchen. Warren had recovered quickly, glaring at Gibson with narrowed eyes. I don't know who the fuck you think you are, little punk, but this is between me and my wife. Need to get the fuck back and mind your own business. If I have to hit you again, you're either going to jail or the hospital. You need to make your way out of here while you still can. I thought Warren was going to give up and walk out. He lowered his hands and shuffled a few steps to the door. But at the last second, he lurched forward, shoving his shoulder into Gibson, pushing him back into the bar. I heard Gibson gasp for air, but he was still standing. And then all hell broke loose. After ordering me to stay in the kitchen, Sam and about three other men landed on Warren, trying to pull him off Gibson, who was pinned against the bar. Warren was furious, yelling and cursing at the top of his lungs. He reminded me of a rabid dog. "'You can't divorce me, whore!' he yelled, getting an arm free enough to point at me in my hiding place in the kitchen. "'So you can move on to some other nigger? You so goddamn independent. I don't need to give you no fucking money.' I told you I wasn't paying you shit, and I meant that. I'll see your ass in court. Let go! The small crowd fought with Warren until he'd been forced out of the door. Then the door to the bar was shut and locked while they watched him get into his Mercedes and speed away, his tires burning thick black lines into the pavement. The place was quiet, eerily so, the only sound being the low murmur of the TV in the background. I poked my head around the kitchen doorway and watched activity slowly resume, a few customers righted the bar stools and tables that had been knocked over in the melee. Uncle bent over to pick up the bat that he'd threatened Warren with. I left the kitchen and headed straight for Gibson, who was trying to catch his breath and wiping sweat from his forehead. Gibson, are you okay? Me? He shrugged, offering me a lopsided grin. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. He didn't hurt me. Are you sure? I reached for him feeling around the area where Warren's shoulder had slammed into him. I was surprised to feel a firm wall of muscle under his polo shirt. Do you need to go to the hospital? You could have internal bleeding. Gibson grabbed my hands and squeezed them, then tipped my chin up with his index finger so he could see my face. I'm fine. How are you? Do you need to go to the hospital? No, no. I shook my head. I'm okay. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm going to speak to my paralegal. I don't know how that notice got published today instead of tomorrow. But believe me, someone is going to pay for that mistake. Gibson, no, it's not worth someone losing their job. But tomorrow the bar would have been closed and he wouldn't have been able to find you. We'd plotted the placing of the ad with every consideration and contingency, except that the ad would run early. Had it run the next day, it would have given him some time to cool off before I saw him. He would, for sure call or text, but Warren didn't know where I lived, so a scene like today wouldn't have happened. He's a suspicious person. He was going to find it eventually. If not him, one of his friends. He was going to come find me eventually. 
I don't know where you learned that throat chop move, young man, said Uncle, back behind the bar. He pulled a beer from the cooler and offered one to Gibson. But it was good. Almost as good as a hit with my bat would have been. I'm the youngest of four brothers, said Gibson, twisting the cap off his beer. He took a few long swallows before continuing. A kid has to learn how to defend himself pretty quickly. Vanessa, I think you ought to go on home, Uncle said, one eye on the door. I eyed it, too, like Warren might come busting through it again. I can handle the rest of the evening. It should be quiet. But Auntie was bringing the girls, and we were going to walk home. I'll take her home. Gibson set his beer on the bar, already headed back to his table. I'll call Marilyn, tell her to keep the girls with her for a while. I don't want him waiting around, trying to follow anybody. Uncle, I'm fine. I don't— Little girl, I don't put my foot down too often, and I know you're almost thirty, but get your bag and let this young man get you home and safe. This ain't no request, and I'm not going to tell you again. I popped my mouth closed and moved to grab my belongings from his office and back out to the front of the bar. Gibson was waiting, satchel over his shoulder, keys in hand. You make sure she gets inside. Doors locked. Alarm on, you hear me? Gibson nodded and waved, then took me by the elbow and guided me to a gray Jeep Grand Cherokee parked at the curb. He opened the passenger side door and made sure I got inside, closing the door behind me. When he got in on the driver's side, he inserted the key and turned it in the ignition. The engine purred to life, as did the navigational system and the stereo. Seatbelt, he said, pulling his over his torso and snapping it in. We're going three blocks, Gibson. I didn't just defend your honor back there for you to die in a slow-moving traffic accident. Seatbelt. I rolled my eyes, but grabbed the belt and pulled it across my body, snapping it into place. Defended my honor? Something like that. He put the SUV in gear and pulled away from the curb. Which way are we going? I pointed to the right and gave him directions to my condo. While he drove, I was nosy, looking around the interior of his vehicle. This is a very nice ride. Not what I expected a lawyer to drive, though. Really? What do lawyers drive? I shrugged. I don't know. Benz? BMW? Something not a Jeep? He laughed. Our brothers drive Range Rovers. Is that a lawyer's ride? Yeah, that's a lawyer's ride. Leather interior, wheels that spin, probably. Not quite that bad, but yeah. Built-in TVs and stupid shit like that. Waste of money. I like this car. It suits me. I relax for the few minutes it would take to get to my building. It does, actually. It's nice. Luxury. But understated. Not flashy. Like your shoes. My shoes aren't flashy. Are they supposed to be? Clarks aren't your average shoe. But your footwear isn't balling out of control or anything. Believe me, I've seen some dumb footwear. A client showed up for a house tour in some $1,300 shoes once. She had to take them off halfway through, walking around some folks' house in stocking feet. Thirteen? Damn! I forgot you sell houses to rich people with too much money. Where do I turn in? I directed him to a parking spot near the resident entrance. Before he could turn the car off, I laid a hand on his arm. You don't have to see me in. I'm fine from here. Did you see that bat your uncle has? Gibson's right eyebrow lifted. I'm not going to let him use it on me for the first time. He said to make sure you get inside. I'm going to make sure you get inside. He turned the key in the ignition and the engine whined to a stop. Let's move. I grabbed my bag and he grabbed his, and he followed, more like escorted me to the elevator, up to the fourth floor, to my front door. I unlocked the two deadbolts and the knob lock, and as soon as the door was open, disarmed the alarm system. See? I'm in. Safe. With the tips of his fingers, Gibson pushed me further inside, then walked in behind me and closed the door behind us. You mind rearming that? I punched in the code as he stepped past me, towards the living room. Um, hey. First, please come right in. Second, drop those understated but expensive shoes at the door. The guy that owns this place had these floors redone before I moved in here. I'm trying to keep them looking nice. Gibson smirked 
but kicked off his shoes and lined them up neatly next to mine. Then he slipped his bag off his shoulder and set it on the couch, a microfiber L-shaped piece that took up most of the living room. This is a cool place. I like the exposed brick look. You have a nice view of downtown. He walked to the window and bent to peer out of it. I hung my bag on its hook and dropped my keys in the bowl I kept them in on the kitchen counter. We like it. Took a while to get us into it, and even then we had to call in a favor, but at least it's ours. You've seen how my uncle is. I love him and my Aunt Marilyn, but I couldn't live with them any more. Gibson turned away from the window and walked toward the couch, settling into a corner and motioning for me to join him. I hesitated, but only for a second, sliding onto the couch but keeping a few inches of space between us. I tucked one leg under the other and turned so I faced him. He seemed a little scared for you back there. Yeah, he did. But that's not the first time he's been scared for me, so... I shrugged and averted my gaze, knowing more questions were coming but not wanting to answer them. Has Warren ever been physical before? Like that? Not like that. But he's put his hands on you before. My non-answer probably answered his question. I saw him tip his head toward me, and my attention snapped back to him. You have some bruises forming where he grabbed you, he murmured. Not too bad so far, but it's definitely going to leave a mark. I blew out a breath, a long one, and turned away, resting my elbows on my knees and my face in my hands. This was my life, for years. He liked to threaten me, grab at me, pull me around. He never touched the girls, but I was sure it was only a matter of time. I paused gulping back a sob, wrestling with my emotions. Everything was fine until I started working. The girls were at school, and I was sitting around, playing socialite all day. That definitely wasn't me. I decided to take some courses and get my real estate license. He thought it was stupid. He said I was too dumb for college, that I should depend on my looks until they run out. I finished my course, landed a job, he didn't like that. Didn't want me to have my own resources, but it was spending money. I'd use it for me or the girls. Then I got a job at Donovan Realty. I glanced at Gibson, who was sitting next to me, listening, watching. Big houses, fancy houses, million-dollar homes to very important clientele. It was definitely a come-up. My boss sold your mother that monstrosity of a house your parents live in, I started making serious money at Donovan, learning from my female boss, feeling smart and empowered, like I could do anything I set my mind to. Warren wasn't into that feminist shit, he called it. I started to see how he treated me, how he talked to me. He had no respect for me. I was something to do, somebody to manage his house. He took longer trips, started withdrawing from us. Not only attention, but money. I wasn't paying attention. I woke up one day and he was gone, and the house was being taken and my credit cards were cut off. I had no gas in my car, a few thousand in the bank. Thank God I had the sense to open my own account, or he'd have cleaned that out too. I felt Gibson closing the space between us, then laying a hand on my back. The adrenaline rush and the subsequent shock was wearing off. In its place was fear and exhaustion. I felt my body begin to tremble, a sensation I couldn't control, no matter how hard I clenched my fist and squared my shoulders. I knew something would happen. I thought I was ready, but, Gibson, I was terrified. It's okay. I heard a whisper in my ear. His arm slid across my shoulder and cradled me close to his body. He didn't hurt you. You're safe. It's okay. I knew. I knew. I tried to say, through sobs that racked my body. I knew I couldn't get away from him. He'd never let me go. I collapsed against him, out of energy, out of words, out of stoic strength and positivity. Gibson, never let her go. I twitched and clenched my jaw, first in anger, then in the effort to not show my anger to Vanessa. Let me make something clear to you. I know what I'm doing and I'm good at it. I've got something for everything he thinks he can throw at us. I will not stop until you're away from him for good. 
but Vanessa was shaking her head, wagging side to side. He's just going to keep coming and coming. He'll keep at it until I'm out of money and I can't fight any more. I tipped her chin up so she could see me, so I could see her. I don't think you heard me, Vanessa. It's not a matter of money. I made a promise to you, and I'm going to keep it. But I blocked her lips with my thumb so she couldn't say what I knew she was trying to say, what she said all the time. She wanted to make sure I knew she couldn't afford an expensive divorce, and I did know that, but it had no bearing on the service I wanted to provide to her. I wanted Vanessa to be divorced, for her, and for me. Admitting that to myself was more difficult than it should have been. It meant, a little bit, that my mother had been right. From the moment I met her at Kincaid, my manhood had been dictating how hard I would work on Vanessa's divorce. She hiccuped, which seemed to bring her to some level of stability. She glanced around at the room that was darkening in the approaching sunset, then got up from the couch and headed down the hall. I heard a door close and the faucet run, heard her blow her nose, and then nothing. For a few long moments, I heard nothing. Vanessa, are you okay back there? Vanessa appeared around the corner, stopping to lean against the wall. She was still in her clothes from working at Sam's, a white button-up blouse and black pants. I'm fine, just embarrassed. About? I sat forward, resting my elbows on my knees, clasping my hands together. Where do I start? About my life blowing up in front of you? About Warren's behavior? About not knowing enough when I met him that this would be my life ten years later? You must think I belong on one of those dramatic-ass shows they have about women who have nothing going on but drama. I laughed. One of my brothers is addicted to love and hip-hop. I have to hear the update every week. I don't think you belong on any of those shows. Besides, I loosened my fingers and spread my hands wide. I'm an attorney, in a family of attorneys, and my father is a judge. I could tell you some stories that would make today seem like a day at the park. She laughed, halfway covering her face with a hand. Really? Like, like what? I need to be consoled. Come sit, I said, patting the sofa cushion next to me. And I'll tell you some. You'll feel normal in no time. Um, okay. She backed up a few steps, angling her thumb back down the hallway. I want to change really quick. I smell like Sam's and take your time. I started to sit back against the couch, but I thought I would ask, unless you'd like for me to go. No, she answered quickly. Please don't leave me alone. Not yet. I'm, I'll be right back. She whirled around and rushed back down the hall. When I heard the shower come on, I relaxed, sinking into the couch, then reached for one of the remotes on the coffee table in front of me. I pointed at the small TV on a stand across the room and scrolled through a few channels, most of them snow. A purple remote sat next to where the original remote had been placed. I grabbed it, switching to the HDMI screen. It didn't seem hard to navigate the screens and programs. She was logged into Netflix, and the kids' channels popped right up. Oh, we don't have cable. Enough to watch the news. I'm sure you figured that out. I hadn't heard Vanessa come back down the hall. She had put her hair up in a high ponytail, scrubbed her face, and donned a long Falcon's T-shirt and black leggings. She sat down next to me on the couch. I caught a hint of vanilla as she scooted back and got comfortable. Somebody at work told me about that Roku thing, though. I got it for the girls. If they want to watch something on cable, we go to Auntie and Uncle's. I have a thousand cable channels, I admitted, sliding the remotes back onto the table. And nothing good is ever on. I only watch baseball, the occasional home improvement show here and there. I don't know why I have so many. We were the same way. It was crazy, but we were paying to watch a couple of channels. Not only that, but satellite radio, random subscriptions. I had to let it all go. But this little thing in Netflix helps me make sure the girls don't feel deprived. I'm sure they don't feel deprived. She shrugged. I do my best, but kids can be cruel and I just don't want them singled out because they look, you know, like they don't have much. 
It's been a long time since I could buy them a name brand they recognize. Is that them? A silver frame on the end table held a photo of two medium-toned little girls with ponytails, big smiles, and their arms around each other. They both wore T-shirts, jeans, and sneakers. They look happy. Looks like they have a lot, actually. You're doing a good job from over here. Her eyelids lowered a little. She fidgeted with a loose thread at the hem of her T-shirt. Thanks. I'm hard on myself. About everything. Who isn't? She tipped her head up, her eyes wide and questioning, unbelieving. What do you have to be hard on yourself about? Did I mention I come from a family of lawyers? Overachieving, one-upping lawyers? Sharks, if you will? I laughed when she laughed. Some days I question everything I do, everything I want to do. I keep hoping I'm doing the right thing and that my family will see that. I especially hope that my clients see it. Otherwise, I'm wasting my time. Got my mother mad at me for nothing. As the only one of your clients in the room, I assure you that I see it. Yeah. And I'm sure your other clients see it, too. Sylvia wouldn't have punched Warren in the throat. Actually, I laughed, loudly at the mental image of my mother doing just that. If you get Sylvia Kincaid mad enough, she'll do a lot of things you wouldn't imagine she would. Sounds like more stories I need to hear. But, for the record, it was pretty sexy that you did that. I turned my head toward her, hyper aware of how close our bodies were. I felt her body heat, smelled her shower gel or her aromatherapy oil, and saw a spark of something in her dark eyes when I looked into them, something I thought I had seen before, but I'd written it off. Tonight, it was definitely there.